It is January the 14th, 2023, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography Hello. 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 Three voices, three people, three pictures. Yes, I saw I'm late in 2023. I missed a show, I think, didn't I? Yeah, what, what happened? Happy New Year, Adrian. What happened? Uh, thank you. Well, happy New Year to you both, too. Uh, I had uh, some family stuff going on. Actually, uh, do you know what? Actually, um, uh, it was uh, better than family stuff, even. It, it was uh, time to go out with my wife. We went to see the Book of Mormon, which I've been wanting to see for years. It's um, we were up in London having cocktails when I should have been recording a podcast with you guys. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, 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 you're excused. That's okay. That's fine. Ah, so... Jeremiah and I, we talked uh, about Antarctica last episode. Um, now, Adrian, do you have anything as exciting, as awesome, as amazing? <laughs> no, obviously not. Can you, can, you keep, can, you, can you keep up with that? So, I, so, so t- clearly 2023 is a difficult album for our band. Um, you know, you start off with the showstopper and then the second track is always a bit of a dip, isn't it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> You know how it is. Second Jack. That's the way album. it is. It's not the one you're ever going to like get yeah, get to number one, is it? No. Uh, but uh, I have, um, uh, well, I, I've been slightly controversial, hopefully, in, in or sl- piqued people's interest, hopefully, in the title for this show. And just for, so that listeners uh, and viewers know, um, Jeremiah and Chris also don't know what this show is going to be about, um, other than the title, which is a Q2 for Adrian. So um, any ideas, guys, what this show is about? Well, it could be a new camera, the likes of which is, as you know, my favorite camera. Or it could be something about the second quarter predictions of our economy. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, welcome to the podcast about everything stock trading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Chris, do you have any ideas of what this week's show is about? Well, Q2 sounds camera camera adjacent in some form. So okay. All right. That's... You got me. You got me. Hands up. Because you, know, you know, you 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 had this you had this thing last year where you went like all in on iOS and iPhone and uh, yeah, you had, you had the weird rugged stuff as well. But uh, it was mostly mobile iPhone stuff. And I thought you were gone for good. You were down that rabbit hole for good. Um, but apparently. There's something you know. There's something I'd like. I, I feel the need to share with you. Yes. Um. Uh, so. So. Okay. So. For for the record, I have not bought a Leica Q2, but I yeah, have okay. bought a new camera, and it is an equivalent. I'd like to think of the U, of the Q2 at uh, 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 possibly five percent of the price or something <laughs> like that. Is, so is um, there a, is there an equivalent to a Leica? That's the main question we'll have to ask here. Yeah, but it's spelt with a Q. Yeah. <laughs> And a K. L U I J. Like something. Like. Well, so more. shall I put you out of your misery? Okay, I'll sure. hold it. Up. I'll hold it up to the camera. So this here is my new, well, new to me, second-hand camera, <laughs> which is my Q2. It is. A hold on, new... hold it. Let me see. I'll I'll bring you up here. Uh, oh, there we go. You can a see Nikon, or as you call it, a Nikon. It is a Nikon. It is a Nikon One V One. Uh, the the Nikon One the, is that is that the one with the ridiculously small sensor? Uh, it is. It's a one inch sensor, so it's equivalent to what you get in your like your little pocket Sony RX One Hundred or or something like that, or in in the larger sensored you know three sixty spherical cameras and things like that. So so and it also has the added advantage of being about ten years old. Um, but uh, yeah, so but the, this is this is a range of cameras, right? That ever since they were launched, I've always wanted one. Interesting. I mean, I've, I but I'm, I'm trying to set the tone for the entire year with some sensor size snobbery. But um, oh, okay. Well, you you go right ahead. Um, I'm sure Jeremiah's six by nine film or in a large format or whatever <laughs> can 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 knock us all stone dead. I mean. I mean, to be fair, we, we before the show, we established that uh, the video part of this, you're filming yourself through an iPhone. So you switched away from your 
but quotes better camera for that yeah yeah so so that's that is uh yeah in in domestic news um I, i'm in the process of a, a study swap with my wife uh, ah, okay uh, because our needs have changed over time and actually the rooms we were in were not suitable so currently i'm in a pretty minimalistic setup in my new study uh so viewers will notice there's a new painting in the background um rather than the normal stuff uh there is and um, yeah things are a bit different so I'd basically i'm trying out the new continuity camera setup that, mm -hmm. that allows you to just seamlessly use your your phone camera um with with your mac uh so uh well um, you, you uh, comment comments are welcome but it, it was dead easy to set up it literally was no set it was like what camera do you want to use do you want to use your phone camera yes please when i logged into this call so uh, there was literally no setup to do which was um which was quite nice um so yeah so the q2 the q2 reference is i don't know if you can see i'll hold the camera up to the to the to the camera again um, i don't know if you can see but it's got a fairly pank no i'll hold it the other way around it's got a fairly pancake ish lens um and that lens is a 10 millimeter f 2.8 and it is uh the crop factor on a one inch sensor is about 2.7 so my tongue-in-cheek reference to a q2 is that i have bought a 10 year old camera for peanuts uh it has an equivalent to a 27 28 millimeter lens on it uh and therefore i now have a q2 <laughs> okay okay is, well. is that like saying you know i just bought a five-year-old chevy volt and like what do i need a tesla for <laughs> uh i i don't know because i've uh... i'm now speaking to both of you as tesla owners and myself yeah all three of us now yeah now absolutely. That teslas um, so would it be that equivalent well, I can't talk about the Leica thing um, because I've never used a Leica Q2. I, I don't think I've ever used a digital Leica of any kind. Um, uh, I've played with film Leicas, but I've never, uh, never used a digital Leica. I can talk about a suggestion. Of... Suggestion as interruption. Don't start now. No, <laughs> because <laughs> you will have less appreciation for your Nikon. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. So, but as long as you haven't used it, you can celebrate that camera, um, you know, with gusto. Well, I, I, I will. I will. I think, I think I will. I've never owned a Chevy Volt either, <laughs> but, but I do have a six-year-old Renault Zoe, which is pretty much the same thing in European terms. Uh, and there is a bit of a difference between that and the Tesla. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. I can appreciate what you're trying to say with the, with the car metaphor there, Jeremiah. Understood. Message received and understood. <laughs> um, so, well, uh, let, let me count the ways uh, 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 that the, the Nikon V1 with it is similar to the Leica Q2. So uh, it is uh, fairly simple. Right? I understand the Leica is very much, it's a photographer's camera and it's very simply set up and it's not one of these all singing or dancing, trying to do everything. And so you don't have massively complex menus or, or anything like that. Um, so, so in that sense, you know, uh, taking a trip back to how camera menus were 10 years ago is actually a breath of fresh air. Reminds me of the the original X100, Fuji X100 versus the Fuji X-T3 that I have today, we had the, you know, where, where you have about 20 times as many menus and things like that. So, so in that sense, um, it brings back some of the simplicity. And um, it's a lot smaller, I think, than a Leica Q2. Um, uh, it's not quite trouser pocketable, but it is coat pocketable if you have the small lens on it. Uh, I can't zoom in using the 40, 50. How many pixels do you have on your Leica, Jeremiah? 48. Yeah. I've got about 10, I think. <laughs> and that's not 10 yeah, megapixels. That's about 10 pixels. I can, up to, I can get less if I, quote, adjust the, um, the kind of virtual zoom on it. That will bring me all the way to seven or eight. Difference, of course, is the processor the lens um are all very very much integrated so there's that um, yeah i think if i tried to crop the 10 megapixels that come out of this camera i might start to lose some resolution uh in, in a meaningful well, way but it's got 
in my in my pick, I will I will make a point for not needing many megapixels. So, okay, well there you go. Look forward okay. to that. But on up upside, um, I do have. Uh, of course, the ability to change the lenses on this camera. So I may not have you know, the ability to do, to do that the, um, automatically uh, without changing it, but I have uh, other stuff. So I bought another lens. I've only bought two lenses with it. I thought I'd start off with a kit. This here, right, and bearing in mind, that's the length of my thumb. So there is a lens here that is the length of my thumb. And... It is a 30 to 110 millimeter lens. But what, what does that mean? Uh, it means basically 80 to 300 mil. Hmm. Um, so I have a, a lens the length of my thumb that can give me 300 mil of reach. Now, clearly, it, it, it telescopes up a little bit to do that. Um, yeah, because uh, it's, it's not an internal zoom. And then when you put the lens hood on it, it's kind of, it looks like a sort of avant-garde pepper pot of some sort. <laughs> If I hold it out there, you can imagine grinding Parmesan out of it, you know, or something like that, can't you, in an Italian restaurant? <laughs> the pepper pot lens, yeah. A pepper pot lens, yeah. Um, but it's a, it, yeah. But that gives me a, that the one lens alone gives me a three hundred mil reach equivalent, equivalent anyway. So yeah, I just thought I'd buy it for fun. I mean, the camera was less than a hundred quid. The lenses were similar, um, yeah, but yeah, you know, it was just. It was just there and it looked like it might be fun and I've wanted one for a decade and you know, and I can pretend I'm like Jeremiah and have a Q2. So there you go. <laughs> There's a Q2. Wow. Uh, one of the things that I really uh, loved about the Q2 when I was away is it's a sealed camera mm -hmm. so that it is splash proof, weatherproof, rainproof. So if you happen to find yourself in a zodiac or <laughs> or in or in British weather, then yeah, you... either or, yeah, or currently in California weather. Oh, or that, yes. Yeah. Then then you're 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 pretty safe. Um, but uh, I I thought that that's one of the advantages. Yeah, I, this this one doesn't do that. Um, I have other cameras that do that, of course. Uh, if I have the right lens on my Fuji X-T3, that is uh, weather sealed. Uh, I also have the Olympus Tough camera, which you can yeah. literally throw in the sea. Um, uh, so so that that's kind of taken care of uh, through different cameras. Um, although I, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, Nikon did release a waterproof version of the nikon one series i can't i think um can't remember what it was called and it there was only like one lens they ever released with it which was also waterproof or something like that and i can't remember how deep it goes or anything like that but uh they, there is within this range of cameras there is the possibility to get that weatherproofing i don't know how much those cameras cost these days um i, I don't suppose there's many of them ever sold in the first place to be honest <laughs> <laughs> so, so have you had extensive, have you put it to extensive use yet or is it? I've put it through some, some training, uh, some, some testing. Um, I, I've taken it out to London and, and played around with it in the markets in London. I've tried shooting the, the long lens to see how the vibration reduction on that works. Uh, I've tried, um, uh, tried some low light stuff, just shooting around the house in low light, just to see how it how it works compared to things like a phone or or you know or a bit and and uh, of course to, to compared to a bigger sensor. And do you know what? It holds up really really well. Um, it's really easy to use uh, as a point and shoot camera if you happen to be out and about and want to point and shoot. It focuses very quickly. It has you know hybrid phase detection focus on it on the sensor. Uh, so so that works really well. Um, it, uh, you know, uh, and the image quality in terms of, you know, sort of noise and things like that in good light is really good. Um, in low light, it is less good than a modern camera with a larger sensor, obviously, yes. but it still hangs, it still holds together really surprisingly well for what it is. And so it is. the question is, by which standards are you evaluating the photos that come out of it? Because the, I'm asking, because I just recently ran across an article, which is from October, um, in Petapixel. Um, this one that says Gen Z is bringing back digital cameras of the early 2000s. And um, that's like four, five, six megapixel cameras. And the kids, Gen Z, now bring those back because of their aesthetics of the photography of the washed out, uh, straight on flash uh, kind of type of photography that these things do. The way they are different from their, um, from their devices 
from yeah. their phones that they take pictures with. And it, it's it's one of these it's a mix of nostalgia and um and excitement for well I think it's mostly nostalgia to be honest cuz this is like this this 20 year cycle where things seem sometimes tend to come back and that is one of those for sure so is that something is that nostalgia you know what it's it's like 8 bit 8 bit aesthetic right yeah. and celebrating that i mean we you know when when 8 bit was there there was some frustration on fun network. Yes. So I, I and yet now it's uh, or, or 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 you know what was when we printed off um those printers, you know, the ones and zeros, X's and O's. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, on, on dot matrix printers yeah, yeah, and yeah. create art with those, you know, I, I I guess it's a bigger discussion about you know, reminiscences, the emotion of growing up with something true that connects you in your formative years to an aesthetic or a process or a song. And later on, when you have developed maybe a more sophisticated aesthetic or sonic filter, going back to that creates an emotional bond which you're unable to create using contemporary aesthetics. And, and so that may explain... Are, you know, I, I'm not going to say devotion, but attraction for those kinds of retro um, aesthetic, whether it's visual or sonic. Please discuss. Discuss. Uh, well, di uh, discussing it in the context of this particular camera that I've yeah. bought, I, I would say it's it's not particularly close to that. So I actually have in in the drawer somewhere. A 2008 vintage Lumix tiny, tiny point and shoot camera, which I took out a year or so ago for the first time in probably 10 years um, and had a play with that. And that very much would fall into this category that Chris was talking about, which is that it is an, you know, it's a 2000 point and shoot. Um, and if you're in a decent bright daylight, it could give you a half decent six megapixel photo. But if you, if you stress test it in any way, it falls apart very quickly. But it is, it does have the advantage of being ha about half the size of a, a Sony RX100. I mean, it is, you, you can fit it almost in the coin pocket of your, of your jeans, right? Not even just, yeah, the front pocket. Um, so, it, and this, this Nikon is definitely streets ahead of that sort of experience in terms of image quality. I bought it not so much for the nostalgia, but because I wanted something small-ish, but that was just fun and simple. You know, I don't. I've tried shooting with, you know, my, you know, just going out and walking around and shooting with my Fuji camera, um, which is incredibly competent and makes fantastically technically high quality images. But I don't get a lot of joy out of using it. And so I was just thought this is, you know, cheapest chips, right? And maybe it will give me a little bit of fun. And so that's the role hopefully it will play. So far, it's playing that role quite well. Uh, that's all right. Don't, don't and it does it with sufficient image quality that it, it, it it's not quite the same as the the whole digicam renaissance i don't think <laughs> cheapest chips Look yeah that. <laughs> yeah They're totally cool totally fine like that. Like that. and if it makes you happy even better well do you know what this the it, it, it may not, right, in the long term, it, uh, but it, it, I could probably sell it. Well, but the people I bought it from for about, you know, for, you, for only a tiny amount less than I actually bought it for. So if if it lasts for three months and then I and then I sell it on, I mean, we, fine. we have we have established on this show over and over and over again that uh, the, the gear is not the photo. The gear is not the important thing. I'd I'd rather shoot through a for the for glass shard. And uh, have something interesting. I just recently came across the Museum of Weird Lenses, which is nice. uh, a guy who co collects not just like tens, fifty, a hundred different kinds of lenses that he collected. Uh, weird lenses mostly, and he he shot a YouTube video about all of these. I'll bring that as an as a as a, a pick of the week in another episode. But um, that sounds cool. That's 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 um, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather shoot with the Holga than with the best camera possible if it suits the subject. If it suits. I, I, I'm I'm a hundred percent with you. Um, you know, it it I always say, give me anything that will take a picture, and I'll 
you know, I challenged myself to make a good picture. Um, um, Kai, Kai Wong of Digital Ref TV, he had a series um, of pro photographers with cheap cameras where he yeah, invited yeah. invited well-known photographers and gave them something like a Lego camera or a Barbie camera or something like that and gave them, gave them an afternoon of time and followed them around with the camera <laughs> and, and they... They had to well. What most of them did is they 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 used the camera and they they try to figure out what where its strengths were and how you yeah, could trick exactly. it into doing certain things. And then they ended up with photos that were the, pretty much the best photos you can you could get out of these weird cheap plastic cameras. Yeah, I always think it's best to find the bo both the weak link of the camera and this and its kind of strength as well, and to explore both sides of it. Because sometimes it's the very things that the camera really doesn't do well that can create a very original and interesting image. And some surprises. <laughs> yeah, we so, push it past its, its kind of... So here's, here's an assignment for you, Adrian. Um, we have this website where we put photos, tfttf.com slash photos. The link is in the show notes. And... Uh, Jeremiah has uploaded some of his ice and and icebergs and penguins and things uh, from the Antarctic. Uh, how about you do a little photo series for the show and upload it there so people can have a look? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Little I, I, three I, I, three photos, three photos, or or choose ones that you took that you like. Just just to give us like something to some something to feast our eyes on. Yeah, no, I think I think you'd be, uh, yeah, all, all aesthetics of my photographs aside, I think you'd be reasonably, you know, pleasantly surprised yeah. at the quality of the images this thing can make. So yeah, I'll give I'll give that a go uh, and say I th on on the surprise thing, um, I've had a couple of surprises with it. One of the things that that is interesting, an interesting feature, is that well, that has an electronic viewfinder, of course, because it's a, a small mirrorless camera. Uh, it doesn't reflect the exposure settings that you've got in the viewfinder. <laughs> so it's like a, like an SLR pretty much. <laughs> it, 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 it's always, it, it's, it's like, oh yeah, okay, I think I got that right. And it, it, or at least not by default. I think if you do, if you use the exposure compensation, it'll do some exposure compensation in the viewfinder as well. So I don't know whether, it, I think it's just you know, old and a bit clunky and less sophisticated than you'd be used to these days. Um, I mean, boy, if, if, I, if I have to sort that camera into like buckets of, of camera quality that would still go under modern camera for me i think i think that's fair right from yeah. my initial testing yeah you know, there, there it has some quirks but yeah don't they all um and it, and of course it's not right up there with you know cameras that you could buy you know brand new today with these yeah you know, with decent big sensors in them um, it'll probably even get outstripped quite easily in technical quality by cameras you buy today with the same size sensor, yeah, with a one hour sensor. I mean, somewhere I have a Casio, I think it has 380K. <laughs> nice. <Fair. laughs> and, but the problem is it photographs onto those little floppy disks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and no, this one does use SD cards. Yeah, and, yeah you can so still modern. buy the batteries and stuff. So like modern. That. Ah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing some photos from that camera. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to taking some and making some. You know, it's um, it's it's great. It's uh, it, it's it's fun, right? And and the, I have taken it out a few times, and I feel good having it, and it's fun to use and stuff. Like that's that. all. That and it's autom it's automatic, I assume. So. Uh, yeah, it it is. So you can um, you can have it in fully manual mode, including focus, but that's all done through. It's all the adjustments are done through the buttons on the back. So yeah, the little you know click wheel on the back is how you assess. Is how you change the manual focus, um, and you know, you can put it. In, you can change. Uh, there's a few buttons that you can change the um, the shutter speed and the uh, aperture. But it's all yeah, you know, it's all a, a repurposing of buttons that should do something else. There's no yeah. You know, the lenses for this system have no controls on at all. Not even a focus ring. Right, so you know, uh, it is very much a, you're you uh, an intermediate camera in the sense that you can get some control, but it's not really designed to be used in that way. It's designed to be used in a point and shoot kind of a way. So. All right, but I think the interesting experiments as we get more sophisticated 
with um, the technological advances of capture instruments and the software integrated into that, which is every month or so at this point, there is an elevation of that, is, is how does that integrate with traditional p- practices? In other words, the, you know, a wet dark room, um, 3D printing that becomes sculptural, just the integration of the new and the old often creates something uh, surprising yet again and can be recaptured. Um, I, I'm, you know, obviously have been very fascinated by how that tension between the old and the new work in terms of traditional photography and modern techniques, you know, even pure software. Because I've been printing my work now uh, that I've done on Midjourney and and, uh, the likes um, and integrating those prints into, you know, choice of paper, ICC profiles, subtle changes, differences, piezo. Um, But the most surprising stuff that I've done, and maybe I'll put this up next week, is... um, I've been printing on glass. I haven't actually had going to a lab that, that will print on glass, but I've been printing it on the reverse. In other words, uh, the, the back of the glass with, with, the, uh, with the image, uh, no highlight ink at all, so it's completely transparent. Hmm. So the only thing is grays and blacks. So you, you put that in front of a, a bright surface then? No, I then gild it with gold leaf. Oh, okay. More die. <laughs> <laughs> and how do how do we how do we get from the ten megapixel camera to gilded prints? <laughs> it is that is an it's really astonishing. First of all, they they become more than uh, images. Uh, they become objects, and sure. the objects themselves have this, I guess, dramatic tension aesthetic tension. They're gorgeous to look at. Um, and because of the reflections and, and, and the gold itself, real gold. And they're small. I've been doing, you know, maybe six, eight inches at the most. Right. So there's a preciousness to them. And, and I'm, I'm kind of in a deep dive about uh, making a show of these. Um, well, I think we have to make a show of these if you... Yeah, you see that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I can, I can, hold on. Maybe I'll throw one up as a, into, well, talk. That, that could be a pick of the week. Um, yeah. <laughs> speaking of picks of the week, how about sliding in there? Um, well, seamless, Chris, absolutely seamless. Very seamless. Yeah. That was very professional. Clearly done this before. <laughs> um, so let me, let, let me kick this off because I, have you might you might remember before the end of the year I showed you this wooden box with glass plates in it and oh yeah and so, which was my which was my between the years project and that project uh, has come to fruition I have finished digitizing us uh, all in all some two hundred pictures most of them on glass negatives um, and have put it on a web page to or a website to document it so. Um, there's albums, there's the old family pictures. Let me change the size on this one. So there's the old family pictures. Um, I was like entire albums of people that some of them we can still identify. My parents can still identify some of them. Some of them we can't. I have no idea who these people are in this picture, for example. It's all old, black and white. Again, very delicate. Um, and I... Let me let me show you the process here. So so this is the box that is all came in, and the glass negatives are well, they have emulsion on one side and are clear on the other side, and then some have a date written, handwritten on them. So I think the oldest one is from somewhere in 1931, um, and uh, yeah, of course they're negative, so you hold them against the light, and uh, I scanned them. Um, here's the contents of that. Um, and I did scan them uh, with a with a copy stand, a camera, um, 20 megapixels and 70 Mark II. So nothing 
overboard here. Again, the 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 resolution is not with these kind of pictures, the resolution doesn't add anything. And um, if we need to go into more detail and into much higher resolutions on some of them, then I can still pull them out individually and redo them. Or you but, could um, do, or you could use AI <laughs> <laughs> and, and create things that are not there. Well, so so it all tethered directly into a laptop and then into Lightroom, and then the, the processing was done there. The the okay, so <clears throat> there was some restoration necessary for some of those pictures because some of them had fungus in the emulsion, so um, which is impossible to get out from the emulsion, but um, that kind of rubbed off on the glass side on the negative that laid on that. So that was the side of the negatives I could clean, and some of them needed that, most of them didn't. Um, there was, um, yeah, like glass cleaner involved and, and isopropanol, all these things. Um, and then some of those were broken. So here's a photograph document, which you can see this big uh, riff going through it, which in some cases I did some digital restoration. In that case, I didn't because it went right through the uh, signature here on the document and I wanted to keep it as pristine as possible. But then, like some faces, I cleaned those up when there was dust embedded in the emulsion or some nice. emulsion was missing. That so great, yeah. looks good. That was fantastic. That was that, uh, this Lightroom. It's just a... Yeah. No, uh, it's a click, next. by the way, <laughs> AI brush. It's an AI brush, so it does... By the way, yeah, next step, Photoshop, neural, colorized... And yeah, I was I was really careful to not overdo the processing sure. because because I didn't want to, to to make them clean because they aren't they are 80 90 year old photos so um I was uh, it was a good experience doing that. I also found out that part of my uh greater family older family it's, it's all from my father's side uh someone emigrated to to Constantinople and the the and and they had to f to get some documents back from them but they couldn't cuz they didn't speak turkish and the people in constantinople now istanbul didn't speak german so what they did is they went to the priest and the priest speaks latin and the constantinople yeah. priest also speaks latin so they had there's an uh, there's an entire correspondence in Latin, asking uh, for them to check for some documentation of someone who emigrated. It's, it's weird. It's That's wild. absolutely fantastic. It was wild. Uh, so, so you've um, been able to bring all of that back, and now, of course, you can share it with the rest of your family and stuff like that. Oh, I'm sharing it with the world. I mean, those people, no, no one is alive anymore on those pictures, so I'm not, I'm not hurting anyone's person, uh, anyone's privacy or anything. Anyway, have you seen some of the AI going back? To <laughs> yeah, but that, that actually animate slightly animates. Yes. A yes. Picture. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not gonna go that there. Is, it is very disquieting. I don't know. Like to, uh, I done this to a great grandfather image that I had, and it it does for a moment feel like you could reach in and 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 just see how how they were. I mean, it's probably totally false, but... Um, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> they're probably scowling and like, you know, just get away from me. But um, it, it is, there is a strong sense of keeping it nostalgic, keeping it uh, yeah. as recorded, um, and then, but also modernizing it and comparing the emotional connection on both ends. I think that's kind of interesting because yeah, as we, I, we've talked about this before, black and white being very abstract and not very realistic, and yet yeah. it pulls us into what we consider documentarian or truth rather than something that may yeah. appear sharp. And, and, I, and, I, and I, de I deliberately decided to also document the process itself because uh, a lot of people looking at that now wouldn't have any idea what was going on and where that stuff came from. So I, 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 I shot a lot of uh, photos around the whole thing on an iPhone to put them in there. Uh, one thing interesting: there was a box next to the um, to the bigger box which contained a camera. So oh. there's a there's a an old folding Zeiss Econ camera that um, here you go. Uh, nothing special. I mean, you get these on eBay nowadays for like. A, 50 to 100 euros so um but it, it was it's still 
kind of interesting because that's the camera that some of those pictures have been taken with and so it has some uh well a different kind of value and it's all wrapped in in newspaper so here's uh july 1944 wow so it's it's, it's interesting because it's um it's not just the camera oh by the way right before the end of the war it had to be registered with the mayor and uh, cameras and okay. and radio uh, apparatuses had to be registered with the authorities. I really, it, it interesting, was war. but interesting because Germany, especially during the war, were very famous for documenting absolutely everything and every process. So you think, are all of those processes and registrations and images were they ledgered, um, or they were they not? Well, in this case, pretty much, yes, yeah. it was in some ledger, and he, they got it back after the war. I think they had to hand it in, and it was it was marked and had labels on it and everything. So, yeah, a bit of, a bit of history there. And I'm not an historian, so I did what I could in terms of the, the documentation and the reviving the negatives and making them into proper pictures again. But um, any any historians from the, from my father's side, the Hausch family from. Rottweil and Horp in Germany. So um, anyone listening to this, we've sent out the link to family and um, let's find out if, if they know a bit uh, more. Speaking of history, I, I've i just been um, engaged. We, we watched the first season of, of a film call, of a TV series called The Empress, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you know the German piece. Um, but it is absolutely dazzling. It, it's kind of if you're a fan of The Crown, for example, mm -hmm. uh, this is a good segue into, you know, Friends Joseph and the, the, the court, uh, the empress, uh, and and the life of the court. Uh, but it's so beautifully done. It's just incredible. Highly recommended. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I've, I've hijacked the whole... Picks of the week. Um, that's awesome. That's fantastic. I love it. Adrian, yeah. your turn. Uh, well, mine we've already talked about a little bit. <laughs> um, so mine is a, a technical recipe, my pick of the week. <laughs> uh, because, as I said um, uh, earlier, using uh, my phone as my camera today, uh, using the new continuity camera uh, capability. It's not even an app because there's literally no interface. It just appears as a usable camera on your laptop. Uh, so, like, like in all the menus where we, where you would select a camera, you can now just uh, choose your iPhone. Yeah, I think in on the Apple website they use FaceTime calls as an example. Yeah, because yeah, that's that's the software they have. But you could, if you're recording a QuickTime video, um, you know, or if you're doing a Google Meet or your, yeah, you know, whatever it is that you would do for your video calls, it just appears in the list of cameras. There is literally nothing to do to set it up. It's quite quite astonishing. So, uh, how do you like, for example, let's say you launch this yep um when you dial down to the little gear it'll just appear as a camera yeah it sure is yeah. camera yeah and it um so my, my little recipe is a uh, continuity camera uh plus obs uh the uh i can't even remember what obs stands for is it open broadcast open broadcaster software it's, yeah. it's the it's the tool that we use to record this uh show to do the video and everything yes. yeah absolutely um it, which is enormously powerful software which i only know about less than one percent of but and what open source you can do is that you can you can choose a camera source and you can do things with it so you can put color filters on it or you can route it to different places it, it basically creates a new camera and allows you to move that that data around in your in your software so that you can do what you want with it and you can put a filter on it and change the colors and that kind of stuff exactly yes yeah. so, so my, my the LUT, the third element of my recipe here is is a lot um uh, so you can take, if you happen to be in suboptimal lighting, like I am right now, um, or if you happen to just you know, want to play around and do things, uh, so you can have, uh, the, there are some, you can change the colors on the feed that comes through in OBS. You can put a LUT on it. You can change the opacity of that LUT so you don't have it overly strong. Uh, so I picked a LUT out of a list of stuff I had on my hard drive, you know, applied that with a, with quite a, a low opacity, um, because if you want it to be, you know, really over egg and um, made a little color correction to take a little bit of red out uh, and and that was it and and naturally you know, uh i mean you guys can can tell me and chris you're you're receiving the the full feed looking just fine 
so yeah um i'm quite impressed and it was all very very easy to set up and by the way you know for those that don't use obs and don't wish to actually the the fact that it is really easy to use um it is good and especially especially with an apple laptop which is they are not famous for good webcams so there's they no they're not I, I, so much better yeah I, my laptop is so when i'm next on now in case Canada. Next on location, I just kind of get one of these little thingies. Yeah, okay, little stand. I've got mine on the desktop tripod. I have yeah. an auxiliary auxiliary pick for that scenario because <laughs> you you need to you need okay, so here's here's the thing. You need to fix that camera somewhere to your laptop screen so it looks yeah. over the screen. That's the natural position for it. But I've looked for for uh, various kinds of like holders and, and stands and things and i found one and it's this it is a oh, it is a, a great piece of plastic the size of a credit exactly the size of a credit card so you can put it in your wallet and it is called the elephant card it costs 10 bucks here um again way overpriced for a piece of plastic but what it does is it folds into a little holder so um oh, here we go nice. It folds into a little holder that you can hook up on your screen from behind and you can slot your phone into the thing. So so, so these, these little ears, that's why it's called an elephant card because it looks a bit like an elephant. You can, you can pretty much swivel those out right. and, and now you have a three-dimensional thing and you hook one side on your laptop and you hook your phone into the bigger hooks that now look like elephant trunks and... Um, and that and attaches it, your phone to the top of your yeah, laptop, and so you don't need. Ah, oh, now that's really interesting because I just dug a little desktop. Laptop no suction cups, no nothing. Out. It doesn't weigh anything. Again, yeah. ten bucks. Okay, well, it it it, it solves a problem. It solves a really so, difficult problem, or well, not a difficult one, but it's 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 tedious to find a holder and whatever. Yeah, elephant and, card. I'm and, a man. Yeah, yeah. I don't fancy carrying my desktop tripod around in my yeah, laptop go. bag wherever I go. So and so as you were talking, I just ordered it. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should get a commission. <laughs> well, Chris, what we need you to you do, do Chris, though, what we need you to do, Chris, though, is teach us how to change the, uh, to, how to do a transform on on the uh, on the video. Because yeah, if you have a lap, if you use a laptop top camera, as everybody knows, if it's if it's not looking like it's looking up your nose, it's still all squint because of the angle. It's not vertical, and your camera is probably at chest height if you've got a laptop on the desk, rather sure. than at eye height. So you know, uh, I don't know how much whether whether the the new technology will automatically correct for that. You could use books, books, yeah, uh, books, <laughs> books, cardboard well. boxes. Uh, I mean, that laptop on a book, yeah, definitely. Literally, literally, what you do, you bring it up to eye height. It looks best. The camera I have here, I'm I'm standing, and the camera is on my desk on a on a tripod, and it's exactly at eye height because that's sure. typically when it looks best. So, or you get a tilt shift lens for your smartphone and. <laughs> you and your power shift lenses. All right, Jeremiah, do you have a pick of? Well, uh, I do, I do, uh, and I, I s just slid in one of my experiments uh, with Gold Leaf in our uh, T fob. Uh, Trying to find it. Oh, in in the in the photo. In the photos, yeah. Okay, I, mean, I just threw it in there. Let me open that and uh, take a peek at that, and then I'll I'll just. To a little chip oh, chip. that that looks like a, okay. Let me bring this one up, and then let me bring this one. Up. Please, there you go. There you go. I mean, you can't really get a sense of. First of all, it's very sharp, and uh, but it's it's pretty amazing. So this is an image that, that that's the workflow that you were telling us about a few minutes ago. Then, where you've generated something in Mid Journey, printed it on glass with uh, and with gold leaf on the back. Yes, awesome! It looks fantastic. It looks um, it looks three dimensional. It does. It looks really well. It is three dimensional. Well, but it does it does look three dimensional even here on the two dimensional screen. So it has a lot of depth to it. Yeah. Um it, it takes a long time to do it. And I also uh, really am playing with how much of the flaws I want in there because part of it is that balance between machine learning and how 
perfect it is and <laughs> and it reminds me of the of the negatives i worked with i can i can show you how to get the spots out in lightroom no i i i don't need to get the spots i've been affected <laughs> believe it or not you know just the flaws of the leaf or something anyway not for another day um on uh pick of the week uh it's a it's a book um oh, that you was it on still life and uh you can see it did you sound a link? Yeah, yeah. There's a link to the action okay. before. I think it is vanished from my copy of the show. Yeah, it has That's vanished from mine too. What's it. what's the name of the book? Here it is. Hold it up. Oh. Hold it up. I'll bring you. I'll bring you up on the screen. Here you go. Hard plus Mark Doty. Yeah. Doty. Mark Doty. Doty. Still life with oysters and lemon by Mark Doty. Uh, anybody who's into still life as an aesthetic. Um, and as photographers or painters and, you know, any, any manner of, they, they, they kind of, we draw a lot from the aesthetic of still lives and um, it will be the subject of my next uh, One Man Show in March. Um, and for, you know, for previews, uh, I didn't put the, um, I have new work on tinroof.studio, which, uh, tracks a very interesting evolution from some of the kind of organic stuff all the way through new color work um and some still lives uh which i've been playing with so tinroof.studio anybody wants to visit it's there but that book is very inspirational in terms of an approach and it because it's a a literary approach it's a kind of there's a counterintuitive aspect to writing about still life so I encourage anybody who is interested in that form um, to take part. Awesome. Nice. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing. We have, uh, this was a good episode. I like it. It was very, very... Free form. Um, well, very varied, very, very colorful. Everything in there from the oldest analog to the latest digital and, and in between. So good stuff. It, it did. Very, very good. Very, very good. And for my workflow. All right. Um, we'll be back soon, I think, next week. Until then, everyone, um, find us at thefuturephotography.com. See you uh, soon. Until then, everyone, take care and have a good one. Bye. Bye. -bye. This is where the video ends. Well, where it should if I have the timing right and I mixed that I messed it up. <laughs> it You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. <laughs>